Hello, welcome to the Charity Impact Podcast, where we aim to help you increase your charity's income and impact by sharing the experience and expertise of our guests. Thank you to those of you who have given us a five-star rating in your podcast apps, and thank you for the lovely reviews I've seen on Apple Podcasts. We love to hear from our listeners, so please do continue leaving reviews and engage with us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Also, if you subscribe to our emails via the website, you'll find out in advance who our upcoming guests will be and you can submit your questions for me to ask them. I'm Alex Blake, your podcast host, and I'm joined today by Ruth Ibegbuna, a serial social entrepreneur who has founded Reclaim Project, Roots Programme, Rekindle School, and Northern Soul. We're going to be discussing Ruth's experience, including how to meet the needs of your community, fundraising and working with funders who get it, things that have worked well, things that haven't, and the learning from that, And if that sounds good, I recommend you also check out the episode before this one with Ben Lindsay, founder CEO of Power the Fight. And I'd like to thank Derek Bardwell, our guest in episode 12, for highlighting the work of both Ben and Ruth. Welcome to the podcast, Ruth. How are you today? I'm good. The sun is, well, kind of shining. It's all good. Yeah, (laughs) seems to be a recurring theme recently. (laughs) People say, oh, yeah, good, thanks. It's nice and sunny here. And I look out the window and it looks really (laughs) great. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) All right, cool. So I wanted to ask you about some of the successful initiatives that you've set up. So you're a a serial social entrepreneur. You've set up Reclaim Project, Roots Program, Rekindle School, Northern Soul. I'd like to ask you about what you've learned from your experience of setting these up and growing and leading these organisations. So first of all, how did you go from being a teacher to a social entrepreneur? It, it feels like quite a kind of change of gear. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how did it all start? Well, I think the more natural fit is probably the social entrepreneur. And mm-hmm. I was a teacher who was constantly innovating in the classroom right. and my head teacher, wild, constantly coming up with projects and ideas. So it's probably a more natural fit. But I'd been teaching for several years. I'd become quite disillusioned with the structures of teaching and the hierarchy of management and all those kind of, I love working with the kids. So that's one thing that never changed. I love that. And so when I left teaching age 30, I wanted to do something that was more direct working alongside young people and communities. And I was lucky enough to go to work for an organization called Urbis that was looking for a head of community. And I pitched to interview the idea of Reclaim. I literally pitched it, interviewed yeah. like, oh, that sounds good. So I was lucky enough to have a space to run a project with young people. And it's kind of just snowballed from there. I've realised I'm a type of person that likes Mm. inventing social projects. So when you you start up Reclaim or one of the other organisations, obviously you've you've identified an issue that you want to address. And then where do you start in terms of deciding the approach you're going to take to tackling that issue? Well, the way that all my organizations have started is what people are saying and especially what young people are saying you know now I'm 47 years old I haven't got a clue really <laughs> what a 12 year old is <laughs> a pressing need in his community but then you have to go and ask them right so you you start off by talking to those young people or the communities or whoever it is that cares about the issue the most and you work alongside them I think I've learned through time that you know I'm pretty good at galvanizing support for things I'm, I'm quite good at pitching about things but I'm not the person who is central to it. And I'm often not the person who's got the deepest lived experience. So it's more about me working alongside those people and me saying, right, what can I bring to this? What's the issue we are trying to solve? And then we work together to kind of find a solution. And doing that with young people is the best of all, because there's no sense of what you can't do. Sometimes young people put stuff on the table and you're like, really? Is that what we're going to do? And then uh-huh. try and do it. Yeah. Has that stayed the same? over the years is that is that something you stay true to because it seems grassroots organizations are always really good at doing this and then sometimes over time get less less good at, at being driven by the community's needs it's a really good question because i remember a few years ago a funder said to me part of the issue that you've got ruth is that you need to decide if you want to work at the grassroots or if you want to be a thought leader you can't do both and I, that's always really stuck with me. It's really motivated me to prove that wrong oh, yeah. because that's part of the problem, isn't it? You have to choose. You, you start off grassroots caring, being committed and passionate and courageous about things. And after a while, you get comfortable and you turn to a thought leader, right? And <laughs> actually, I think if you can hold those two things, then it kind of keeps the energy where it should be. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm, I'm often not getting it right, but that's what I'm trying to do. No, I think that's right. And I think it's it's being close to 
grassroots level that gives you the legitimacy to then speak as a, a thought leader or whatever term you want to use when you're when you're kind of publicly speaking about issues. Yeah, absolutely. And how has the work changed over time? Because it's been what, 15 years or so since you started Reclaim. So have there been some shifts in the type of work that you deliver? Yeah, the work that I'm really interested in is when you, you're trying to make a case for something. You know, I've run charities, but in my heart, I'm a campaigner. And, and so that's a, a, an awkward tension sometimes mm. because I'm very activist and very open about my views. Anyone can look at my Twitter feed and, and know where I stand on things. So to go from that to running a charity and, and having rules that you've got to adhere to, for me, is often a very fine line. And, and so that's been a bruising encounter at times because I, I truly believe that if you are fighting for those people who, who need you to use your platform and your voice, and then you can't use a whole of your voice, that can feel like a, a, a really frustrating space to be in. I've got older. I started when I was 30 and, and I became a CEO at 33 or something like that, which is really young age. And I've made plenty of mistakes along the way that have shown me how not to do things. So I think I think the way that I'm leading things now is different to how I did initially. I think there's a lot of kind of fire and energy and that excitement initially, which maybe I'm a bit more tempered with that now. And I'm much more into finding a shortcut, a nice middle-aged shortcut now is what I'm, <laughs> what I'm looking for. <laughs> In terms of that campaigning side of things, where have you found the barriers? Who's been trying to stop you from speaking up? Do you find is that media or politicians or local authorities or what's the sort of barrier there, do you think? I think sometimes it's in the way that charities are structured. So you can mm-hmm. find yourself with a chair who wants to toe a, a more careful line. You've tweeted out mm-hmm. something. It's like, no, you can't say that. And when you've got the kind of nature that I have, the idea that you, you can't say the things that you believe in mm-hmm. become very difficult. And, and then you want to battle against that. But then if you've got a larger structure, such as the Charity Commission, you've got to be very, very aware of that point. And I, and I think that, that so often charities are, are kept quieter than they should be. Mm. So more recently, two of the organisations I've started are not charities, and then deliberately not the charities to allow us to have a bit more freedom and a bit more space to be authentic and to say the things that if we felt we needed to say, we could say. Mm. And the newer ones, are they kicks? Are they set up as? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, got, so they're still like yeah. social non-profit organisations, but yeah. slightly different structure. Yeah. And obviously it's not the legislation, is it, that stops people from campaigning. So it's it's more so that the boards are often so risk-averse that actually it's your own board rather than the Charity Commission or, and maybe like misunderstanding among people on boards there's this fear well we can't say this and that because the charity commission and whoever else will come down on us when actually there isn't as long as you're not being party political like it's absolutely the role of charities to be speaking up about these issues and you see that's a really interesting thing to talk about because i think it's exactly that i think that quite often when you've got organizations that might feel quite activists or feel quite energetic or very grassroots quite often the board feels that they're they are there to look at governance. So they are by nature quite risk averse. Mm. So one of the things I've learned, you asked me earlier, what have I learned? I've learned actually that I have to have boards that recognise what we're trying to do and are with us on the journey. And it's almost like they're a golden yeah. thread where we are as an organisation. So we have at the moment, for example, with Rekindle School that I run, which is a, a youth-led school that's all about critical thinking in working class communities. We have a board where everyone is incredible and everyone's under 30 years old. Mm. Now, we've got a lawyer there, we've got accountants there, we've got all the things that we need, but we also have youngish working class professionals who get exactly why we say the things that we say and they're just as passionate as the staff team. That, for me, has been a huge shift by not feeling that you have to necessarily go for the great and the good of established people out there. You're just making sure you've got people who've got the skills to support you and not having a board that necessarily see they have to hold you down but see you fly. That's been really important. Yeah, that sounds amazing. It must have been really frustrating for you personally, having been the founder and not having the the freedom to to act and speak in the way that you want to. Yeah, yeah. I had lots of meditation apps. <laughs> yeah. Before and after board meeting. <laughs> one, one earphone in during the board meeting. <laughs> uh, yeah, I always think that's, it's tough charity founders, like what's the right role to play because you can't be 
like the chief exec and the chair yeah. in the way that you could have that type of role more so in, in a corporate organisation. So, yeah, it's a tricky one, isn't it, to go right? Yeah. But it's also about us being aware, especially as founders, I've always been a founder of something, right? Mm. And there's also being aware that when being a founder is getting in your way, mm. yeah, founders, course, you, know, yeah. you know, like, it's my baby. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, you, and you wait if that person going to look after the baby as well as you will. And and sometimes that person comes along, so sometimes that person doesn't come along. And, it, and it's really hard to walk away from something, especially if you don't feel that the person coming along is, is the right person. But the best thing in the world is when you see your the baby fly without you, right? Yeah. So I think that's the, the best thing as a founder because you realise you've set things up correctly. Yeah, it certainly sounds great. What you've set up at Rekindle there where you've got everyone involved, board level, staff level, people accessing the support, everyone there is from that same community and, and has that same vision and set of values and everything. So yeah, yeah that sounds great. Yeah, cuts down on the explaining, right? It's just, <laughs> yeah, we, all, yeah. we all get yeah, it. Yeah. We know what we're here. Uh, yeah. we, know what we're, we know what we're up against and we know what we're seeking to achieve. Yeah. And we've all, including me, been on the same kind of journeys and we've all faced the same challenges. So all of a sudden you're just like, okay, let's just do the work. Yeah. Let's do the work. Yeah, it's interesting as, as well, isn't it? And that, yeah, you can just, there's no reason why you can't just set, set things up in that way for people have that perception again, oh, I've got to go and find myself a lawyer. I've got to find this. I've got to find that and have that picture in their mind of what a board looks like and go and replicate that, even though that's not really what they want for their organisation. Well, we had one of our favourite board meetings it was during lockdown. No, it was just after lockdown. So we, we could have met up in person, but we decided to, you know, people got small children all to it. So yeah. we did. And we were having a meeting and someone was cooking some food and someone was being berated by their mother for eating <laughs> of hot water. And I just, I remember just watching the whole meeting and just being like, this is it. It's like real people with real lives. We're not around a huge table, but we're making big decisions. And it, it just felt a really beautiful thing. Cause if you, if you'd taken a shot of our zoom call, no one would have thought that was a board meeting, but actually we yeah. made incredible decisions. And it's yeah. like the other stuff sometimes can just stand in the way and just prevent some people from being in that space. Yeah. And it's a shame because even if you are that older white male lawyer, that's your life as well. You're still, you know, having all of that stuff at home, but people kind of pretend like that's, they're not like that. And they exactly. put on this false pretense <laughs> of how they have to kind of behave in a professional setting yeah. rather than just being a bit more real. Anyway, I wanted to ask you about approach to fundraising when you're setting up a new organisation and then also as you become more established, what have you tried, what's worked, what's maybe not worked so well? I mean, I might be founder, CEO. I am bid writer extraordinaire. That's what I do. I write bids. <laughs> I, pick, I talk to those who've got money. Obviously, that's the, the biggest stress is just finding the money to keep things going. I mean, I'm very single-minded. If, if I think the idea is good enough, I tend not to get that stress because I, I'm like, this idea is good enough. It will be funded. And I don't necessarily think that trusts and foundations are the only way to fund things. So I'm very comfortable talking to corporates. I'm very comfortable talking to local authorities, whoever it is that needs to help us get this over the line. But I just think it is a crazy situation. It's just not sustainable. I think at the moment, Rekindle's been funded by nine or 10 different funders. The number of report, and, and I've been saying this for at least 12 years, and I know funders are working on it and they're trying to reduce down, but I've just had a, a big bid that I've got to finish by Friday and it's 23 pages long. Yeah. It's just ridiculous. So the amount of time I spend fundraising should really be spent on me doing something more useful with my time. And I just think that, when you find a good funder that you can work alongside that gets what you're trying to do and you can build a relationship with them, then you can look to where do we want to get to in five, 10 years time. And they're the exciting. It's not just the amounts of money. It's the fact that someone's in it with you. Mm. Whereas the ones where you're jumping through endless hoops for quite often when you're starting out, you've got to jump through all those hoops and someone gives you £3,000 at the end of the oh, yeah. day. <laughs> uh -huh. wasn't, wasn't worth it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it ends up costing more in all of the, the bid rights and the reports and the admin and everything than the actual grant's worth, isn't it? Yeah, but I also, I also think there's something that, and maybe this is age and confidence as well, that's come with saying no. So there's yeah. a couple of funders now that we started doing the dance and then we were like, no, we're better than this. If you can't see what we're about and you want us to be something we're not and not be authentic, then you're not the funder for us. We felt out feeling very pleased with ourselves and try not to look at the bank balance and cry. Yeah. <laughs> 
it, we know that's the right thing because I'd rather put my energy into building a relationship, a proper relationship with a funder. And have you had some of those where you've they've stayed with you over that length of time where it's been like a 10-year relationship rather than a three-year grant? No, we've had five-year funding. Mm-hmm. And we've got a couple of funders that are talking to us about longer term than that. And I've got colleagues in the sector who have had 10-year multi-year funding. So I'm cheering them on and then muscle my way into that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, five years. We've got two grants at the moment, they're five years, which it's getting you there. When yeah. you get five years, you've got room to breathe. Yeah. Looking back, what are some of the things you've done that really created a step change for the charity, whether in terms of the types of service or the fundraising or marketing or partnerships? I've got one really clear example on this, actually. And it's when we were Reclaim, which was the the first charity I set up that was all about, well, as we call it at the time, disadvantaged young people across Greater Manchester, something like that. Not very thingy. And we've been working for years, doing really well, winning lots of awards. And then one of the young women who benefited from the charity age 14 came in, Sinead came in and said she wanted a word on behalf of the young people. And she said that the charity wasn't working for them. And we were too bothered about like awards and Guardian articles and this and that. And how were we telling the young people directly they were amazing, but then having a very deficit approach in what we wrote about them or said about them. And she said, how would you feel if every time you stepped out, you were described as like disadvantaged and this and that. And, and it was one of those moments where, everything just changed. Like literally everything's changed at Reclaim then because I knew she was right. She was totally right because we, we were doing that dance, having the young people in the room and telling them you can be anything, you can achieve this, that and the rest of it. And then when you're writing your, your funding bids, talking about the level of poverty and, and crime in their community and all this kind of stuff. And we, we weren't being honest. And so we changed everything and we spoke to the young people and said, what do you want to, how are we going to do this? And what we came back with after a long period was working class young people, being seen, being heard, leading change. And some of our trustees were very challenged by that. Like, what, are we letting the young people run this thing? (laughs) But And we lost funders. We had funders who Mm. just felt, which seems ridiculous now in 2023, but in 2014, being upfront about working class young people was seen as being very, very challenging. Some of the funders, they felt it was was provocative language. So we lost funding. Mm. And there was probably about six months where I just thought, oh dear, what, what have I done? But then new funders came forward and young people felt more engaged and we actually went on to have a far more successful kind of future. But that was a disruption caused by the young people. And I'm so glad they did. They called us out, really. Yeah, it's interesting that class is not really discussed that much still. It's just seems to have bubbled up to the surface a little bit more in the charity sector, specifically over the last year or so, maybe. And funnily, it was Reclaim Project, I think, was the first sort of report I saw came out that was talking about class in the sector and the, the, some of the sort of barriers people from working class backgrounds face within the sector in terms of their sort of career development and, you know, what, what they deal with in the workplace and that type of thing. And I think since then, I've seen like one or two interviews about it and there's a group set up for working class fundraisers. So there feels like there's been a little bit more. Yeah. You know, I was one of the founders of the 2027 programme, which is the one you're talking about. So the 2027 uh, yeah, yeah. is about working, talented working class people, working in kind of trusts and foundations in the grant giving sector. And what's so surprising is we're bringing people who've got real talent, real expertise, who knew nothing of this sector, didn't know it existed, mm-hmm. didn't know there were jobs there. And all of a sudden, when you bring those two worlds together, you, you realise that, that some of the professional world is just hidden from certain communities. And when they have access and a way in, they can go in and do brilliant things. So that's, yeah, that's one of the projects that I work on and that I led on in 2007. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We had Derek Bardwell on one of the earlier episodes as well. Yeah, it's a really interesting one because within funders, where 2027 programs getting people placed in grant making organisations, isn't it? And yeah. that's one of the places where it's so pronounced, a kind of lack of diversity and lack of people from different backgrounds being in, in those sorts of roles, which again, then plays into those challenges around getting the funding you need for grassroots work, doesn't it? Because the people assessing those applications and making those decisions usually don't have a connection to that sort of experience. Although I think there are exceptions, certainly to that rule, there are some foundations that 
either have people on their boards with lived experience or on committees or starting to do more participatory grant making. So again, I think there are a few more things happening, but still the minority for sure. So what have you learned that doesn't work? So what are some of the things that haven't worked out? Neglecting the detail and neglecting the stuff that I'm bored by. Mm. And this is one of the things I, I'm someone who likes thinking big, dreaming big, big ambitions, big visions, all that stuff. And that's just, that's my happy place, right? So you can get me doing that stuff and I'm super happy. Get me with a lot of spreadsheets looking at increment expenditure over the previous month. And I will look for someone else to do that work and just to feedback to me what I want to hear. And that served me well until it didn't. And then all of a sudden when things happened, I wasn't over that. And I wasn't over it because it didn't really interest me. So I think the thing I'm trying to do now is to sit with things I find tough and boring (laughs) (laughs) and to give that the space that it needs while still recognizing that my strength is in other things. But in saying that, it's also in surrounding myself with people who are brilliant at that stuff. Yeah. So I've got some of the best strategic managers and finance people around me to kind of keep the charities safe, but also to keep me safe so that I can go forward and do what I'm really great at. Also, one thing I realise is when I recruit in a youth worker, for example, they're put through all kinds of scrutiny. We watch them with young people. We look at what they've done in the past, this and the rest of it. If someone wants to come on the board, previously, we'd kind of look at what they've done professionally, Mm. but not necessarily dig into who they were at the core of their soul. Yeah in the way that I would with a youth worker. And that's one thing that I've changed, definitely. Um, Because at the end of the day, the people who are holding the governance of your organisation are incredibly powerful people. And you have to make sure that you're aligned. And it's not just the skills they can bring in terms of audit, et cetera, et cetera. It's about who are they, who are you letting in? So I'm very, very careful about who I let in. And I think the other thing that I've learned or I've got wrong in the past is when things are going wrong, deal with it quite quickly. I'm someone who just particularly like tension and conflict Mm. and I just kind of hope things will get a bit better. Um, And that's who I used to be. And it's never served me well. And I know it's one of the things you read in books and everyone has been on the leadership courses, but actually having the courage to sit down and have that conversation about it's not working. That's hard stuff. It's really Mm. hard stuff. But to leave it is dangerous. It's dangerous for your organisation and for individuals. So being stepping into that stuff quicker has been something that I've learned. Yeah. That's some really good points there, I think. I just want to say thank you for taking the time to listen to our podcast and to ask a small favour. The whole point of the podcast is to help people working for social impact by sharing the experience and knowledge of our awesome guests. Please can you help by letting people know this free resource is worth a listen. A great way to do this is by taking a few seconds to give us a rating in your podcast player. You can just click the five stars and that would be amazing. Or if you could write a few words to say what you like about the show, that would be even better. The link ratethispodcast.com slash charity will take you to the right place and show you how to do it. That link again is ratethispodcast.com slash charity. If there isn't a rating option where you listen, you can always give us a shout out on social media. Thanks for listening. I wanted to ask you about the approach that you're you take to evaluation or or that your organizations take how do you think about the way that you assess the impact you're having both in terms of being able to demonstrate that externally to funders and other stakeholders but also internally making sure that the work you're doing is effective and feeding in any learning to your your sort of service again just going back to my previous answer this is this is not an area of strength in terms of traditional evaluation so for years i was like oh evaluation because it was a tick box thing you did afterwards right and you made sure Mm -hmm. and now actually what we've got is evaluators who work alongside our team and like I said it's the same thing about what your values who are you do you see what we're trying to do do you get the vision so now we're working alongside evaluators who are part of for example the Rekindle family and they've just um, pulled together our evaluation framework and it made me cry like literally made me cry because it was such a beautiful thoughtful deep conscious piece of work that took in to place kind of social, political, racial history, all those things. And there's come up with a framework of ways that we can evaluate ourselves. It doesn't, they don't like maybe lottery outcomes, but they're outcomes that speak Mm -hmm. to the soul of who we are and of our community. And we talk about um, a soulful education. So now we're looking at things that kind of nourish, we're looking at kind of young people's mental health, we're looking at young people's outcomes in terms of confidence. And 
when you do it that way, then it's very natural to be able to evaluate every single session in a way that feels just part of the session. It doesn't feel like an additional piece. Mm -hmm. I think there's also a culture of no blame, but let's sometimes take risks. And if it goes wrong, we just bin it and we don't do it again. And that's something that we try all the time. So we're always just shifting things and changing things and constantly looking to see how it's working with our young people. But then having a culture whereby we can just go, well, that didn't work. Fine. Throw it away. Tell a different story. We've tried it. And I think that once the team get used to the fact that there's no blame, um, it's all right. You tried something else. It didn't matter. That's not going to affect our evaluations. We're just going to be honest about why we tried to do it, why it didn't work and why we're doing something else. That has left, led to a, a shift in terms of how people see kind of impact and evaluation, all those things. Uh, yeah. And I think often, again, there's always, it's been a perception thing where people think you have to report back to funders that, you know, we said we would do this. We did it exactly the way we said we were going to, and we got exactly the results we thought we were going to get, which of course is like <laughs> pretty unrealistic and, you know, even even something fairly predictable, let alone the kind of complex challenges that most charities are are dealing with. And funders don't funders would rather hear, you know, the learning and the kind of more in-depth, richer kind of evaluation than the sort of tick boxy stuff, which I don't know if anyone ever believed it or not anyway, but I think people are now uh, definitely more interested in hearing hearing the the kind of the learning rather than just the kind well, of one of the, I alluded to the fact that, you know, sometimes we walk away from funding our funders. And this was a really good example because we'd been asked, um, it was about our opening date for a Kindle and we we had everything ready and then there was a global pandemic. So we had to push the date back, obviously, of opening a school. And then we had another date and then we went into like a second lockdown. And so we actually, actually ended up opening about 18 months after the date when we'd originally said to that funder, and most of the funders were absolutely like, good grief, you know, like it's not a problem, just, you know, like, are you all all right? Da, da, da. And it was one of our funders who came back and one of our potential funders came back and said, you know, it's, it's a little disappointing. It's taken you kind of three attempts to open. And, and I had a meeting with the young people and we were like, they're not the right funders for us. They're just not, you know, they're not on the journey with us. If you can't open a school late during a pandemic, then. <laughs> but they were so ready to their spreadsheet of when the school said it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And just so I understand, with, with Rekindle School, like how does it work in terms of, does it sit alongside the kind of regular school curriculum and it's, how, how does it kind of work? So practice? Rekindle School is a supplementary school, um, which means uh-huh. it's open, we open Tuesday to Friday, 4 till 7 o'clock at night, and then on Saturday mornings. And it's based around critical thinking. It's not about kind of English, maths and science, although we do give homework support. It's much more about mental health, about confidence, about curiosity, about change making and a much more cultural mm-hmm. curriculum as well. So we look at the things that they're not necessarily talking about um, in school or the things that curriculum doesn't allow you to talk about, you know, whether or not that's the other day we, the, the young people were talking about feminism. They're talking about toxic masculinity. They were talking about race. They were talking like it's all those things that, that teachers in regular schools don't have the time to really get into that mm-hmm. stuff. But young people are trying to find out who they want to be. So Kindle mm-hmm. space where they can be that person alongside us connecting them to kind of opportunities. So a while ago, someone said, someone described me when I was about to give a speech as a pushy middle-class mother for working-class kids. <laughs> that was just, uh, I was so flummoxed when I walked on stage, but I kind of <laughs> see what they were getting at because we do that uh-huh. as well. We're like, okay, we're making sure that our kids get incredible internships and get incredible kind of work experience mm-hmm. opportunities and we are taking them to um companies they've never heard of just really giving them the opportunity to kind of see what's out there for them to select who they want to be and what they want to do yeah it seems like a lot of that sort of thing is really it's what's useful to people in in life and in work after school um more so than the kind of more academic as you say the sort of english maths and science stuff so yeah that's that's great can I ask, is, are there any resources that you'd recommend for social entrepreneurs or, or leaders in the sector that, um, that you found useful in your work, no. whether it's kind of books or programs or newsletters, whatever it Do you might know be? What? This is the question that I always dread because <laughs> obviously, like, you know, I've seen TED Talks and they've done this and they've done attended oh, yeah. courses, but 
I a, have my head down in the work too much. Uh, and if my head's not down in the work, it's up on Twitter. So, you know, they're, they're the two areas where I am a lot of the time. So I don't spend as much time kind of learning from others in the sector, apart from seeing the work that they do. You know, I visit people doing great work and see the work they're doing. But is, has it been like a transformative, I don't know, kind of experience or course that I've been on? No, I've been on loads of incredible leadership courses. Some of the best ones have been corporate leadership courses, which has been interesting as well. But no, mm. the 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 way that I've learned the most is to be alongside the people that I'm working with. Um, and that's what's taught me. And to make horrific mistakes and to be able to pick myself <laughs> up and, and not make those mistakes again. Cool. Okay. Well, in that case then, is there anything that you would like to say, any sort of final request of the listeners or comments, anything you want to promote? Uh, do you know what? I'm going to say, I mean, obviously I've, I've started different organisations I'm hoping they'll kind of, maybe mentioned but there's rekindle school which we've mentioned a lot there's mm-hmm. also the roots program that um came out of brexit initially and it was about how can we be on such a tiny island mm-hmm. with people that don't know each other at all um, and yeah. roots gets people together for cultural exchanges from different backgrounds and young people from state and private schools to exchange but yeah. i suppose the only thing you know i don't want to get all jerry springer about it but it feels a really difficult time like ridiculous optimist and i'm finding like britain at the moment a really difficult space and so for me, I think there's something about finding those people and those organisations that are trying to be hopeful and trying to do good things and just contacting them and volunteering a bit of time. Um, and that's not necessarily to go and paint a wall or do anything like that. It could just be mm-hmm. taking what you're good at and helping them improve because it's really tough for us out there. And we know that people look and go, oh, you're doing something really positive. And it's like, come and help us. So I just think there's a general, mm-hmm. you know, whoever's out there doing work you admire, give them a ring and see how you can add to it yeah for sure it's kind of what i do for the podcast here is looking for stuff where you know people are doing interesting impressive work and it can inspire people and we can kind of you know draw out some of the lessons they've learned and stuff and and share it on here but your point about it being sort of tough and out there and sort of you know how things have been as a result of brexit and some of those sorts of things but where do you where do you feel that the most is it in the sort of negative news cycle and the sort of social media stuff or is it in real life in communications with with people or in your organization like where do you really kind of experience that i don't think it's in real life thank goodness but i think there's a cruelty Mm. sometimes that's that's being kind of sanctioned and you know the way that we talk about people the way that we are encouraged to lack empathy for people who are suffering and actually, right now in the UK, there's a lot of people suffering. You know, I was I was joking the other day to my partner that like every bit of food in the fridge has got a yellow label on, like reduced from Aldi or Lidl. And then I was just like thinking about that, and I thought, yeah. And I, you know, I'm not the the biggest paid CEO, but I am a CEO, and I am I am looking for reduced food when I'm um, shopping in supermarkets. And and how are other people feeling about that? And rather than it be a time where we're encouraged to come together and support and our leaders are telling us to do that and our newspapers are encouraging that. It feels that the opposite is like we're turning on each other. So for me, I need to feel hopeful. So I'm I'm just looking for those experiences and those people who are doing the future hopeful work and trying to connect myself and align myself with that rather than that prevailing narrative of nastiness and um, that, that I just can't buy into. Yeah. I mean, I purposely avoid watching the news looking at newspapers and avoid most of social media I kind of use it for work largely just to promote the podcast to be honest or or to kind of keep an eye out for interesting people popping up and you know reports in the sector and things but my my news feed is very much sector people so they're kind of talking about the issues in the sector and things it's not the kind of wider news cycle and politics and as soon as any of that seeps in it it does become more negative so yeah, I often wonder like my experience when you're talking to real people in real life, it it doesn't feel like it's, you know, like everyone's against each other. But when you look at the news, then it does. And and the rhetoric from politicians, you know, particularly in terms of refugees and asylum seekers and things, it's just disgusting. But yeah, I, I just wonder sometimes like, am I in this nice little bubble in my suburb? And, uh, you know, I'm just oblivious to how things really are. But usually when I talk to people, it is more... It's that online stuff. It's the news and media and things rather than actually people's experience in real life where, you know, 
there, there are still some divisions and things, but by and large, I don't think it's quite how the media paints yeah, the picture. Yeah, just kind of my final thought on that one, because I know you're in the Northeast. And a while ago, mm. I, I went to visit a charity, a youth charity in rural um, County Durham. Never been in my life, but I went because young people asked me to go. And, and I mean, it was rural County Durham as well. And out there yeah. and you could tell there was not much money there was very little for the young people to do and what what else was there were a lot of young people who came from refugee and asylum seeking backgrounds because they'd been placed there and what mm. was a beautiful was the fact this community were holding a weekend to kind of welcome these families and and there was no money that had been particularly provided for them to was a bit of charitable mm. money but there was no you know government money that had been laid on And so what you really had was a working class community that that then had an even more kind of vulnerable community placed within them. No help to get on, to understand each other. to, And yet through that, these people were trained, right? And and you had Mm -hmm. people who'd come, been in camps in Jordan, had come here talking to people who were kind of local to the area, trying to find their way. And it's moments like that. I remember watching that feeling quite emotional and just thinking people Mm -hmm. are good. They are trying. It, it, this is not what you're going to read on the front cover of the Daily Express, but people there were trying to make this work, no matter how difficult it was, and without resource and without support. So it's almost like behind the scenes, there are people trying to do the right thing. Yeah, it's, um, if you'd read that first sentence you said in any of the newspapers where it's a kind of isolated white working class community and refugees have been placed there, you would just think that's going to go on to tell you about all this, all this strife that's being created. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's really nice to hear that. Actually, you know, people generally try and help people, but uh, yeah, it's a shame the politicians can't support that and get behind that rather than kind of stoking all the division. Okay, well, that is a strange place to end the episode in a way. <laughs> Maybe a nice <laughs> but, um, place to thank end. Thank you, thank you for sharing. <laughs> nice yeah, place. yeah, no, that was a that was a really nice story. All right. Well, thanks very much for um, coming on, though. Really enjoyed it. Thanks, Alex. Take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Charity Impact Podcast. Thank you for giving us your time and attention. I know how precious a resource time is. I hope you enjoyed the show. If I could trouble you for a further two minutes of your day, I'd love to hear from you. You can leave a review on your podcast player via ratethispodcast.com slash charity. You can engage with us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Just search Charity Impact Podcast or search Charity Impact Podcast in your browser to find our website where you can email me directly and you can subscribe to our email list for the opportunity to submit questions for me to ask upcoming guests. You can also find all the show notes and the previous episodes and links to resources that our guests have recommended there. Until next time, take care and thanks for listening.